portion is taken from the book of Revelation, chapters 2, verses 1 to 7. To the church in Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent, and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaeans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear the Spirit, says to the churches, to the one who is victorious. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Thank you all. It's a, it's a great joy and a privilege for me to uh, be with you this evening. And I... Uh, I think you had a lot of Zoom meetings today, right? Right from morning, you had your roots. And uh, I think Whisper, uh, I'm so glad uh, you are uh, bringing the, 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 the prayer and the scripture together. I think that is a very important uh, one for us today. And what we would love to do this evening is to briefly look at this passage that was read to us from Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7, and the theme would be ortho Christianity, ortho Christianity. Um, yesterday night uh, for our family prayer, we were, uh, I was asking uh, what would we read? Uh, you know, we were just, uh, we were just talking and say, uh, let's read uh, uh, Revelation. You know, I wanted to read this passage uh, together as a family. And then uh, suddenly my daughter, 11 year old daughter, uh, she said, uh, uh, dad, let's not uh, read this. I said, why? She said, no, no, I'm very afraid of the book of Revelation, okay? Uh, so please, let's not uh, read this passage. Uh, I think that is in some way indicative of uh, how we look at uh, the book of Revelation, either from a, ch a child's perspective or sometimes even grown-ups. Uh, when you look at Revelation, we got to uh, sometimes are fearful of what is there and the mysteries that are involved in that. And also sometimes I think uh, people have focused on the wrong things that made the church to uh, fear or wonder what is going on in this book. Uh, my desire tonight is not actually to look at the whole of the book of Revelation or uh, focus more on that, but my desire is to look at on ortho Christianity and we will be looking at this church in Ephesus to uh, bring to light what I mean as ortho Christianity. Okay, so when we hear the word ortho, I think, you know, for some of us uh, who had a back problem or, you know, some other issues, ortho is always a, a little dreadful word. And at least for me, I've been uh, uh, nursing a back issue for nearly 20 years with uh, all the travel and other things. So ortho is always a dreadful word. Only when it flares up, you are reminded of them. But I think the word ortho, as most of you may know, uh, just means straight uh, or correct or upright and out of which several words have been formed, which many of us know words like uh, orthodox and, uh, and other words that have come along with that. So when we think of orthodox or ortho Christianity, our immediate uh, you know, sense goes towards orthodox Christianity, right? Uh, Christianity with the right thinking or the right theology. And uh, what I want to place today before you all is that ortho Christianity uh, can't be reduced only to that orthodoxy, uh, but it involves several other dimensions as well. And that's what I want to show at least three strands of uh, ortho Christianity, what makes it as a truly uh, biblical Christianity from Acts, uh, sorry, from uh, Revelation, from the book of Revelation. Now, before we would get into uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2, I want to give a brief uh, uh, introduction about the book of Revelation so that we would be careful whenever we interpret the book of Revelation. 
one of the reasons why uh, there is so much confusion about this book is simply because of, there are several reasons, and uh, I would highlight at least a couple of the reasons here. One is the multiple layers of interpretation that is going on in this book. Uh, for instance, you notice that uh, John himself is going uh, through a particular experience, right? Apostle John is going through a particular experience. Uh, so that is one uh, whole area of looking at and to interpret it. And then you also look at the seven churches, right? The seven churches are in the place of what we call as Asia Minor. And in those days, uh, when in the first century they talk about Asia, they don't talk about the continent of Asia, okay? They talked about the province of Asia under the Roman Empire, which is the modern day Turkey. So the seven churches are located kind of like in a ring road, uh, you know, within, uh, you know, each other is in a, a very uh, proximity, was uh, pretty close between each other. And John, who was now in exile at the Patmos Island, is uh, writing to these seven churches. So that is where uh, we see here. So that is one strand of uh, interpretation, right? When you look at that, what is happening in that historical uh, situated reality. And then, of course, from chapter four onward, there is huge amount of what is going to happen in the future, right? Uh, there is this uh, eschatological reality of what's going to happen in the future. And so how do we understand and interpret it, right? So you look at these multiple layers or dimensions of what was going on in this book. And as a result, we ought to be really careful when we interpret uh, this particular book, okay? And the other reason, I think uh, one of the other observations I want to do is that it comes from a particular, what we call a literary genre, right? A particular type of writing, what we call as apocalyptic. And in today's world, when we hear the name apocalypse, we immediately think of a catastrophe, right? Uh, but uh, apocalypse simply means unveiling, okay? It's a revealing, unveiling. So, uh, this book is about the unveiling, and we will see what does it unveil. You know, that is a very crucial question. I think that will make a lot of sense for us uh, when we study this passage. Okay, it's just an unveiling, but it has a particular style of writing. Okay, just like a, a narrative, a historical record will have a particular style of writing. Poetry will have a particular style of writing. Similarly, this literature will have a particular style of writing, and we need to be conscious of that to understand. So it employs a lot of symbolisms, okay, symbolisms. And I think that is where the, you know, the lot of times the confusion happens uh, and uh, as a result, a lot of divisions have happened within Christianity. So we ought to be careful and be reminded of that as we study this particular passage. But there is one thing I want you to uh, remember anytime you study uh, the book of Revelation, I think if you would grasp this, uh, it will keep you, you know, well as you, as you study this passage. Okay, uh, the historical context in which uh, John was writing, you remember at that time it was somewhere around 95 AD, the Roman emperor of the time was a very despotic uh, dictator by name Domitian. Now the Roman emperor worship, you know, those days they used to worship the emperor, so the emperor worship could be traced back several years earlier, but Domitian kind of insisted that he must be worshipped. So there were several temples erected to Domitian and every people have to give allegiance to Domitian. So I think that is something I want you to very carefully remember that. So it was in that context of this great and you know mighty man and everybody need to give their allegiance to this emperor and in fact worship him. And this is also indication of their political loyalty, okay, political loyalty. So as a result of that, when John is writing this, Apostle John writing this, he has to use a lot of symbolism that was obvious to the first century church, but it is not obvious to us, okay? So he uses a lot of symbolism. He can't be very explicit about, uh, uh, about this, you know, the, those who are persecuting against them. So he employs a lot of symbolism and it has got several layers of meaning. So we need to take that in mind as well as we uh, study this book, okay? So uh, these are some of the preliminary cautions I want to do uh, when we read the symbols, you know, the signs that are in this book, okay? So that's something I think I made myself clear. But now 
the important thing we want to see is that the book starts by saying this is the revelation of Jesus, right? This is the revelation of Jesus or the revelation uh, from Jesus, okay? Uh, what does it mean? So this book, the central theme of the book is about the revelation of Jesus, the unveiling of the exalted Jesus as the king and about the unfolding of his kingdom, okay? We must never forget that, and I think a lot of confusion and fear are being instilled in the heart of the church today, and particularly during this uh, COVID pandemic, as people are beginning to, uh, a fresh interest have happened in Revelation, the fear is being implanted just to show as if, you know, uh, you know we, <laughs> we are here right at the end of the age, and as a result, this fear is being brought in, but remember, it is not about fear. This book was not written to instill fear in the heart of the church. But it was exactly the opposite. It was the, exactly the opposite in the context of fear and the unbelievable, incredible persecution. How can the church engage in the world? You know, the easiest thing is to do is to escape, right? To escape engaging with the world. And that's what several people today are saying. If, if the world is anyway going to go bad, why do you engage, right? Why should the Christians be socially engaged if anyway the world is going to get from worse to worse? So that's a, that is something that we need to know, that the book was not written to instill a sort of fear and a fatalism within the church, but rather it was written to inspire faith. So how does it inspire? And you notice here, right in the very first chapter, there is this description of the exalted Jesus Christ, right? Uh, you can go back and read the description of the exalted Jesus Christ. And, and also you notice here in the vision of the exalted Jesus, and also want you to notice in verse three, um, sorry, in verse five, it talks about Jesus as the ruler, now notice here, ruler of the kings of the earth, okay? Now you imagine you have this superman, Domitian, who is asking worship from his citizens. And in the context of that, the word is going to the church by saying, listen, the Jesus who was incarnated in the flesh, who is now exalted, this Jesus, this Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Right? In other words, he has more authority over the Caesar. Caesar is not Lord, the ultimate authority, but Christ is Lord. And for whatever purpose, he has allowed Caesar this authority for, for, to unfold his own purposes. But we must remember who is the king of kings. So he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And you look at the next verse, in verse 6, he talks about that how God has made us to be a kingdom, to be a kingdom, okay? So it is about the king of kings and his kingdom of which we are part of. So that will inspire faith within us, not to instill fear when you look at the Domitians of our own time. You know, I don't have to spell out the names, but you guys would know the Domitians of our own times, you know, who try to, you know, demand complete allegiance to them and, and to their ideology. That's the kind of the world we are living in. So how can the church be not afraid, but how can we have faith when we remember that this is the exalted Christ is the king of kings and we belong to that unshakable kingdom. You know, you read that in Hebrews chapter 11, we receive this kingdom that will not be shaken. So we belong to the unshakable kingdom and we have the unchanging king, the theme of E. Stanley Jones, uh, who used to talk a lot on this. So I want to have that in mind anytime you look at the book of Revelation, okay? Uh, unfortunately, I think, uh, you know, Satan who distorts truth has kind of uh, put us on a tangent where most of the teaching has become on speculation, right? Uh, what is this uh, happening? Is this this number of seal, you know, when this calamity is happening? Or, you know, is this the person Antichrist or 666 uh, referred to a particular person? You've got into that speculative game and trying to put a schedule for the uh, arrival of Jesus Christ. But remember, Revelation was not written for that. It was written 
to instill faith in the heart of the people of God, knowing that the Domitians of the world don't have the final word, but it is the one from whose mouth comes out a double-edged sword, right? The word of God. He who is seated on the throne. Interestingly, the word throne, the word throne appears 46 times, okay? It appears 46 times in the book of Revelation. So you understand the importance of looking at this Jesus as the sovereign king, king of the rulers of the earth, and be as part of his kingdom as well. So I want you to keep that whenever you read the book of Revelation, you talk, always think about what does he talk about Jesus as king and about his subject, the people as this kingdom, okay? I think that would keep us uh, you know, uh, deviating from some of the other things. I mean, we need to know there are several things that are there. We can actually know it's not like a book as in entirely, you know, we will not understand, but we can understand the big themes of this book, but always look at the centrality and the supremacy of Jesus when you look at uh, the book of Revelation. And why is it important? It is important even for the theme you are going to study today. The theme is Orthochristianity and to look at the centrality of Christ, right? And his kingdom for us to understand what Orthochristianity is, is all about. So now when you come to uh, 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 the second chapter, uh, chapter two, uh, the seven churches, right? It's being written to uh, seven churches. Now we may ask why these seven churches, right? Uh, of course, they all are very important uh, churches located in key cities uh, in the province of Asia, okay? So that is, could be one reason. But also the number seven, uh, again, in terms of a symbolic representation, it represents perfection, and probably he would have chosen seven churches to represent the whole of the church, the whole church. Uh, so we may think along those lines. Interestingly, the, the number seven occurs 54 times in the book of Revelation, right? So uh, you see that probably there is a clue there as it is happening. But I want to be careful any time when you interpret the symbols, right? Uh, you know, we can always uh, interpret it tentatively, uh, but there are other things that we can very, uh, that are core to our faith and we can hold on to it with great conviction. Now let's look at uh, the church at Ephesus. You know, the city of Ephesus in the first century was known as the light of Asia, uh, meaning this was also called as the bank of Asia. This was probably the, the most richest uh, city in the whole of Asia, uh, at least the province of Asia at that time. And uh, there was a port that was close by and uh, it was at the intersection of several highways that will go to Rome. So as a result, it was a very, very commercial, big commercial city as well and known for its uh, multiculturalism and multi or, uh, or, or multi-religious city. And in fact, but the greatest uh, goddess of that was goddess uh, Diana or Artemis, as you know, the temple to Artemis was called as the one of the wonders of the ancient world, right? Massive, uh, huge structure, uh, you know, temple of Artemis is there. So, so you can know that this as a church, to understand this church, you can look at in the book of Acts, how Paul started his ministry there and how the church was birthed. You can also read the letter to the Ephesian church to have more background about this church. So I'm not going to go into this church. But just to know this was also the, the city where the temple worship of Caesar, the cult of Caesar was so prevalent. Uh, a few years ago, I was in the, in the city of Istanbul, uh, the you know, capital of modern Turkey. I'd gone there to uh, preach and to be part of a consultation. And uh, at the end of that consultation, we had a, I had a couple of days in my hands. So I decided to do a tour. That is one of the popular tours you can do if you do go to Turkey. Uh, you know, at, uh, in like two, three days, you can actually visit all the seven places where you find the seven churches. And of course, all those places are now in ruins, but the most impressive ruins uh, that you could find among the seven cities comes from Ephesus. I still remember walking down those you know, pavements that are paved with marble, you know, their uh, marketplace and this huge uh, library that still stands, at least the building stands today, just to point the kind of city Ephesus was. 
And there is also a temple dedicated to Caesar right up there. And also known for his immorality, if you walk down the lane, you could even Google and see uh, some of these. You have this massive brothel that used to be one of those famous brothels in that time right in that uh, marketplace. So this city, remember, very imposing city. And in that, there is God has established his church. And now he is sending out a message because of the cult of Caesar was so powerful. So God is sending out a message, again, reminding them that he is on the throne, that Christ is Lord and not Caesar. Caesar is not Lord, but Christ is Lord. So I want you to keep that at the back of your mind as you look at this passage. All right. Now let's look at here, starting with verse one, he says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, uh, the angel could be also interpreted as the messenger or probably the chief uh, pastor or bishop or overseer, uh, you know, various ways it's been interpreted. But now you notice the words, what the Lord says, if there is a description of Jesus, he says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. A lampstand. So if you read chapter one, you would know that he talks about the seven stars of the seven angels or seven messengers, probably the seven key leaders to whom this, this letter is addressed. That is one possible way of uh, interpreting it. And you notice what he says that it is the Lord that is holding the stars in their hands. Right? Uh, I really like about it, particularly when as leaders who are uh, you know, given this uh, arduous task of leading the church right in the midst of this great persecution. It is a great comfort to God's people that God holds them in his right hand, right? Uh, and always in the New, in the New Testament, uh, the symbolism of right hand or right represents authority, right? So the first image that is presented about Jesus, again, we go back to you know, Jesus as the sovereign king of kings is that, that this king holds you and me in his hands, right? In his hands. So as you look at whatever that is unfolding, even in today's world, and I could talk a, a lot more on uh, the kind of situation that the world is heading to, particularly in terms of uh, technology and so many other things, and that can really instill a lot of fear in our hearts. But the encouraging thing is that you and I, are held in the right hand of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so that gives you and me a sense of great security, right? A sense of great security that I am, remember Jesus uh, told in, in, in the book of John that uh, uh, no one can pluck you out of my hand. No one can pluck you out of my hand. And I think that gives you and me great encouragement tonight. Uh, no matter what situation you are in, uh, you know, you uh, as a leader has been interested, you know, to lead several things in your own ministry, career, business, uh, homes, and several other situations. But I want to encourage you tonight that the Lord is holding you in his right hand, right? He is holding you. And so let us be secure in, in that knowledge. And, and not only that, as you, as you notice here, that when Jesus holds the church, this is another important truth I want to place before you. When he holds his people or even the leaders or the messengers of the church in his hand, he is reminding us that the church belongs to Jesus Christ. The church does not belong to the stars, right? To the messengers, to the leaders. But at the end of the day, the church belongs to God, belongs to Jesus Christ. And it is very important that we remember that. Otherwise, you know, in a, in a days of personality cult in our own uh, uh, culture, that is so much, uh, we can begin to think that the church belongs to us or the ministry belongs to us. But we must remember it always belongs to God and uh, uh, he in his mercy is holding you and me in his hands. But then you notice as we move along in this, you know, there are so many implications we can bring out on that, but I have to move quickly towards the central theme of what I want to share with you. Now he walks among the seven golden lampstands, right? Again, when you go back and read in chapter one, the golden lampstands represent the churches, uh, the particular churches. So uh, he, Jesus, walks among the churches, right? He walks among the seven churches. So 
Uh, it's a great picture of God as transcendent, all-powerful. He holds things in his hand. But also there is a great picture of God who is, you know, imminent, you know, God who is intimately moving among the church, right? Because the church is the body of Jesus Christ. So this gives us a great impression that when he tells, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am amidst them, right? I am in the midst of them. So you notice here, the church is not all alone. Sometimes we think like that, right? Oh, God has left us to fend ourselves in a world of Domitians that, you know, we need to somehow, uh, you know, uh, take care of the church. But this belongs to him. He has given his life to purchase this church as his bride. And he walks among the church and he knows what is going on in that. I think that's a great and beautiful picture of bringing this all-powerful God, transcendent God, who is also imminent, right? Uh, as uh, we often talk about ultimate, intimate, right? That's where the biblical understanding of God as ultimate and also God as intimate. You see that picture right here portrayed as you notice here. Now then Jesus uh, is the, through the letter, he talks about to the church saying, he starts by, I know your deeds, right? Because he's walking among the church, he knows what is going on in the church. We can hide, right? People can hide what is going on in our ministry, uh, in our personal life, in our family. We can hide, right? It is possible to hide. But remember, this God who is intimately walking within the church, he knows what is going on. He knows that nothing could be hidden from his eyes. I always uh, tell a story of this uh, little girl by name, Mary, one night she came to her father and said, uh, uh, you know, daddy, can you write in the dark? You know, we who have uh, little children, uh, we are happy when our uh, children ask us something which we can do. So, 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 so the daddy said, yes, darling, uh, daddy can beautifully write in the dark. Daddy can beautifully write in the dark. And uh, little Mary, she walked up uh, to the switchboard and she switched off the light and now it's pitch dark. And then she slowly came to her daddy and said, Daddy, uh, here is my school progress report. Can you please sign in that? Okay, can you please sign in that? And, uh, you know, uh, little Mary was naive. You know, she thinks she can take any mark, put daddy in the dark and get away with it. And sometimes uh, we may think like that. Okay, we may think like that. But remember that Bible teaches in Hebrews chapter 4, Nothing is hidden in God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. To whom we must give an account. So it starts by the Lord saying, I know your deeds. Okay, I know it. He knows everything, what is going on. But also the encouragement is he also knows your hard work, your perseverance. Sometimes people may not recognize your hard work in ministry or what you're trying to do for your family. People may be taking it for granted. Your perseverance and your standing, uh, you know, through hardship for Jesus. And Jesus says, even if your boss, even your ministry leader doesn't recognize you, remember, I know your deeds and I am commending you, right? I am commending you. And I think that is a great encouragement uh, for several of us uh, who are here tonight, knowing that our Lord knows what we are doing even if others may not know what, uh, how hard we are working. All right. And now he talks about, what does he know? He talks about, I know your deeds, your hard work, the, the original Greek, uh, the hard work actually says they toil towards the, to the point of exhaustion. Uh, that's the kind of hard work, you know, the life that they were living uh, in the midst of great persecution, okay? Their toils and your perseverance. Uh, the theme perseverance comes again and again in this church, okay? Uh, you notice again, uh, this theme will come in verse 3. You have persevered, and then the word endured hardship has an idea of perseverance, endurance. And then you notice, and have not grown weary. That is again a theme of perseverance, okay? So in, in, in essence, this is a persecuted church but also a persevering church, all right? Uh, if you were to just distill uh, their work in this way, you could remember the efficient, the efficient church as a persecuted church, but also a persevering church. Okay, persevering church. So God commends them for that. 
And now, as you look, come to our theme of what we are looking at is Orthochristianity. As I told you, there are several strands that mix to build this Orthochristianity. I want to bring you to your attention the first one here, okay, in verse 2, towards the end of verse 2. You have tested, okay, you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false and have found them false, okay. Uh, so the first strand of orthochristianity, which we are familiar, I think what we may call as orthodoxy, okay, orthodoxy. And the word doxy has several, uh, you know, meanings to it. Uh, sometimes it's used as uh, belief uh, and also sometimes as praise. Out of which we also sometimes think about worship, doxology. Uh, so, and often in today's world, it is when you look at the dictionary, it is always talks about it is the orthodoxy of beliefs, right? Of beliefs or the right, you know, when ortho is right. So it is about right thinking or the right theology that this church had. And you notice what they did, Jesus was commending them. What did they do? They said that they tested some of the people, okay, who claimed to be apostles, right? Who claimed to be apostles, but they tested them and they found them to be false, right? So that's the first thing I want to place before you about an orthochristianity is about the about orthodoxy right right thinking uh, right belief and it's very important for us as the people of god because even jesus said in the last days without doubt we read in matthew chapter 24 you know many false teachers would come up and do even great miracles to deceive even the elect if that were possible right even the elect to deceive. Uh, if you read Matthew 24, you notice only four or five times the word deception is there. The word deception is there. So there were several people in those days in that church who were claiming to be apostles. And uh, so they were able to test them and test their teachings, test their lifestyles. And uh, why do we need to test that? Of course, even John uh, in, writes in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1 says that test the spirits because not all spirits are from God, right? You have to test, test the spirits because not all spirits are from God. And Paul, uh, when you have time, please go back and read in Acts chapter 20. He was on his way to Jerusalem and he had a brief stop at a place called Miletus. And there he asked the Ephesian church elders to come. And Paul gives his farewell address, one of the greatest farewell speech you want to you know, study uh, you would study that passage in, in the book of Acts chapter 20. And in verse 28 and in 29, Paul says, after uh, he talks that how you have to take care of your own life and also the flock as a shepherd, take care of the flock. And then he says, after I have gone, many false teachers would come up. He says, many wolves will come even from among you. And they would try to, tear apart the sheep, the, the, the people of God. And Paul, you know, right there, talks about that to the Ephesian leaders, okay? Uh, and now, probably 30 years later, and John, Apostle John, who also had his ministry based in Ephesus, he says that they have tested the apostles. And I think that is very, very important for us. Now, remember, even Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, he said, beware of false prophets because they come in sheep's clothing, but inside they are ravenous wolves. I think uh, Sudan and team find this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, photograph, uh, interesting uh, photograph of, you know, sheep. But you notice how as you closely, the face looks more like a wolf, right? Um, one of the movies uh, that our whole family likes is a movie called Zootopia. And uh, it's the story about... Uh, how uh, things happen in the animal world. And towards the very end of that movie, uh, you know, in the, in the police academy, they are, the police chief was giving out uh, jobs to different people. And then to a couple of animals, he says, hey, you will go as undercover. And immediately they have a mask and they put it on as uh, some other animals and they will go on an undercover. It's a fascinating movie. But that's what Jesus was saying. These are ravenous wolves, but they come in sheep's clothing. They come in sheep's clothing. So now the question is, the question that is before us is that, why is it difficult to detect false teachers? 
are false prophets, are false apostles. Why is that? I want to quickly place before you three because uh, I, my intention today is not to dwell more on orthodoxy, but I know that is a big issue more so in many of our own contexts. So I thought I would say, I want to place this before you. Uh, why is it difficult to detect false prophets and false teachers? The first reason I think is because of the nature of heresy. Okay, the nature of heresy. You notice that heresy in itself is a parasite, okay? Heresy is a parasite, meaning that it can't exist on its own. It always needs a little bit of truth to live on, okay? So as a result, nobody would come and say, hey, what I teach is heresy. Invariably, people will teach from the scripture. Right? That is why it makes it very difficult to detect uh, whether their teaching is you know, correct. Is it orthodox or not? Because of the nature of heresy. It's a parasite. It always lives uh, you know, on a little bit of truth. Otherwise, you know, it will die. Uh, that's a great book. If you get, uh, you could read a book by name, uh, Scripture Twisting. Scripture Twisting, 20 Ways How Cults Misinterpret the Scripture. It's a book uh, by a man called James Sire. James Sire, S-I-R-E. Now, in that book, James Sire talks, uh, uh, in, in one of the footnotes, he gives a fascinating detail that in 1980s in America, uh, they did a survey and they found out that Americans had high regard for the word of God, but low actual knowledge of the word of God. You get that? Uh, that's a very deadly combination. When you have a high regard for the word of God, but you actually know the word of God, you know, the, the, the actual understanding, the meaning of the word of God, if it is low, he says that's when you had the greatest proliferation of cults in the 1980s because all a cultic leader need to do is to point to a scripture and people will think that because of high regard and low actual knowledge, they would just take his interpretation. But I think in our own country and in some of our own culture, not only we have a high regard for the word, but also we also have a high regard for the preacher, right? Uh, so it's like, uh, oh, if, uh, if Annan says this, you know, or if my pastor says there is no second opinion. So this is a deadly dangerous combination because the nature of heresy the nature of heresy is that it always lives on a little bit of truth. And unless we know how to interpret the scripture, even the other day I was talking with somebody and I told them the greatest need for the church today, you know, we often talk about need for the gift of discerning the spirits, right? Discerning the spirits. And I think that along with that, what goes is that is the gift of interpreting the scripture. The need of the hour in the church is to teach our people how to interpret the scripture. It doesn't matter how much you emphasize the importance of the word of God, right? But if you don't teach them how to interpret it correctly and arrive at the right meaning, you are setting them up as a prey to these ravenous wolves. It's so crucial that the church or the people of God teach, you know, we, 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 we understand how to interpret the scripture. That's been my biggest burden as I go and uh, as I minister to various constituencies within our churches. That's so, so crucial. Look at the church in Berea, right? Acts 17, 11, we read that they received the word of God, you know, with great joy and they obeyed it. As a result, what happened? They were more noble than the Thessalonians. But then there it said they searched the scripture daily to find out what Paul said was true, okay? It was not just searching the scripture every day and to get one promise, you know, golden verse that day to go and live by. Of course, you know, there is, a, there is a need for a devotional reading of the scripture to listen to the voice of God. But also you need to read in such a way to find out if somebody somewhere you're listening to know, is this right in the light of the whole of scripture, right? In the light of the whole of scripture. And I think that the task for all of us here, you know, several leaders, Several of us who have been here, every single day who have been here, I think I want the need of the art for us is to teach our people how to interpret the scripture. I think we are given enough emphasis on the importance of the scripture. The, the, the need of the art is to how do you interpret the scripture and arrive at the meaning. I think that is important. So the problem is with the nature of heresy. And the second issue is with the nature of the heretic. Now, the heretic is a hypocrite. You know, the hypocrite is somebody, you know, in the ancient days during those Greek plays, uh, same person will play multiple characters. 
So he will have different masks, you know, not the mask that we use today, but he could have different masks he would put on and then he would take the, uh, you know, the role of that particular character out of which you get the word hypocrite, what you have today. So just like heresy, the hypocrite also comes with a mask. Jesus said in Matthew 7, Paul said in Acts 20, right? Uh, they are wolves, but they put on the mask of a sheep. And that is why it is also difficult to identify uh, false teachers. And the third reason, I'm just moving on quickly. The third reason is about the nature of the hearers, the nature of the hearers, not just the heresy, not just the heretic, but the nature of the hearers. That, for that, I want you to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, where Paul says in the last days, what happens? People who do not want to listen to sound doctrines, but they would gather around themselves great many teachers to say that, hey, tell us what our itching ears want us to hear. They will move away from the truth and they will move towards myths or legends or just stories. All right. So you notice what happened. It is the people themselves and wherever there is demand, I think that will be supply. Okay. And sometimes we are swayed by the numbers. If you notice here, Paul is saying in the last days, many, so many teachers, so many people will like to do that. So when you see the numbers, sometimes we think, Array, I think that, you know, it must be really true. You know, that teaching must be true because otherwise so many people won't be going there. Or that teaching must be true, otherwise this miraculous would not be operating there. So I think we ought to be careful and we must become like the Berean church to find out what Paul said was true. Okay? Orthodox is one of the important strands. I'm not going to say that that is the only strand of Orthochristianity, but I think that is a key strand of, uh, of Orthochristianity. And I want to move on quickly and quickly place before you two other strands tonight, but I spend more time intentionally on the first one because I think uh, that is becoming more and more important uh, in, in times like this. And the second strand, the second strand of or the second dimension of orthochristianity, you can call it as orthopraxis, okay? Orthopraxis, which means right practice, right practice. And often that practice flows out of your theology, of out of your thinking, right thinking, but there is the right practice. And you notice here in chapter two and verse six, verse six, God is saying uh, to the Ephesian church, you hate the, pro the practices of Nicolaitans which I also hate, okay, which I also hate. So what is the practice of the Nicolaitans? And if you come to look at chapter, same chapter two, and from verse 14 to 15, okay, 14 and 15, uh, this is the same heresy that was also found in the church at Pergamum. So that the same heresy is also found, but scholars are kind of divided over what that heresy actually is. Uh, there is a lot of speculation and one strand at least of thinking, one stream of thinking, which I think uh, probably is more approximate or more closer to uh, the reality, uh, at least for me, in my opinion, is to look at here in verse 14 and 15 of chapter 2, where the Nicolaitan teaching is equated with the teaching of Balaam. Okay, Balaam, you have to go back to Numbers 25 and what Balaam did. Okay, this was a man, prophet of God, who enticed the church or the people of God to be involved in sexual immorality and to towards idolatry, two of the greatest sins, you know, in the sight of the Lord. And so as you notice here, uh, similarly, the root word for Nicholas or Nicolaitan means conqueror of people. Nicholas and, you know, conqueror of people. And Balaam also means conqueror or ruler of people. So there is a thinking that both of these are the same idea, that this is a group of people who were saying probably that now you have become, remember it is within the church. Now you are a follower of Jesus Christ and the Old Testament law is done. So you don't have to worry about it, but you can be living in indulgence because immorality and eating food to the idols is not what, as we think, both are associated with temple rituals in the first century. So they are saying you can have much closer relation with those other religions and you can be involved in that because all it takes is that the old law is gone, but now you are under grace 
and you can free even as a follower of Jesus to do that. And uh, I think uh, uh, probably a little bit closer to some of the extreme teachings of uh, probably hyper grace. Uh, you know, we may look at it. I don't have time to go into it today, but I just want to say there is this practices that led them towards an indulgence. This is Christians, remember, followers of Jesus. Uh, people to indulge in immorality and towards idolatry. And Jesus says that, hey, I hate those practices and you as a church hate those practices, so I like you guys. So the second important strand is orthopraxis, meaning praxis, practice, right living, right? Right living, uh, life of holiness uh, that is pleasing to God. And I think you notice that is happening in the Ephesian church. Uh, since we have limited time, I'm just going to quickly move on to the third strand. I think that is where you find fault with these people, where God is finding a flaw in the life of this church. Now, the third strand of orthochristianity, I want you to look here in verse 4. He says, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the first love. You have forsaken the first love, right? Uh, so that could be understood as the love you had at first, okay? And also the love that made Jesus as the first in their lives, okay? Uh, this is uh, two ways of looking at it. One is, of course, there is the chronology where, you know, Jesus was, uh, you know, the love they had first for Jesus that has somehow gone away. And also, not only that, you can also look at priority uh, as Jesus as the first object of their, you know, the first and the fullest of object of the love. I think this season in Open Up, we talk about seek the first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that's one of the reasons also I chose this passage, right? To, uh, to, to look at Jesus now. And then the third strand, we can call it as orthopathy, okay? P-A-T-H-Y. Uh, again, orthopathy is what? It is right uh, relation or a right love. Now, the word pati is very interesting. Uh, it comes from the Greek word pathos out of which you have multiple you know, dimensions or layers of meaning. Uh, you, know, you have words like sympathy, you know, empathy, all of them comes out of that. A deep sense of uh, passion and affection towards a particular person or a particular thing. So pati is that. And out of that pati also you have the medicinal term of pati, right? You have the allopathy and homeopathy because pati also has an idea of suffering, okay? In other words, your passion towards a particular thing is so much that you feel the pain within you, right? That love is so intense that you could feel it within you. And that's why uh, several times, at least 12 times, the gospel says Jesus was moved with compassion. And the Greek word gives an idea that he felt the pain in his intestinal tract. You know, in his inner being, he felt that pain because of that passion or because of that, you know, affection. Uh, towards that particular person or the cause. So when you look at the third strand here of ortho-Christianity, orthopathy would help us to understand this deep passion you and I need to have towards God as well as towards others, okay? And I want you to remember this, if you don't remember anything else, but tonight, if you remember that, I think that's very important. I'll tell you why. Because it's possible to be orthodox it's possible to have orthopraxis in our midst without having orthopathy, right? Uh, remember, when you have orthodoxy without orthopathy, without that uh, deep passion and love for God and people, what happens? The same persecuted church in three years late, three centuries later, when Constantine became the emperor, the church became the persecutor. We went on a witch hunt because of under the camouflage or under the guise of orthodoxy. You follow me carefully. And you can reduce the Christian faith, which is a relation. Orthopathy makes Christian faith as a relation and not a religion. You remove that relation, what happens? Christianity becomes just a religion. It becomes a rational religion if you focus only on orthodoxy. It becomes a ritualistic religion if you focus only on orthopraxis, right? Uh, 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 do's and don'ts, rules and regulations like Pharisaic legalism if you don't have that love. All right. I think I want us to get this very clearly. I often you know, say 
that the great commandment to love God and love your neighbor, the great commandment precedes the great commission. Okay? Both in terms of the way it is put in the book of Matthew, but also in terms of our own living and in ministry, great commandment always precedes great commission. So if you take that orthopathy out, that intense passion towards our Lord and to others, you know, you and I have a stale orthodoxy. You and I can have a rigid Pharisaic orthopraxis. And so tonight I want to submit before you, my dear brothers and sisters, we need all these three strands, orthodoxy, orthopraxis, and orthopathy to make this as the orthochristianity, the vibrant biblical Christianity that can make an impact in the world. I think in our open up, many have spoken so eloquently about in our need to love the Lord and to love people. So I'm not going to go deep. And of course, my time is almost done. So I'm not going to go into that. But all I want to place before us tonight is that as you look at your own heart, with all the great, you know, right thinking and right living, and yet the Lord brings something to the efficient church and says, you still lack something, right? Uh, where is that love? That is that passionate love, you know, like a, a young couple who got married, you know, just a, a young lover. That passionate love you had for me at first, where is that now? How are you operating uh, in your own life and ministry? And that's why every time when Jesus restored Peter in John 21, you know, he always talked about, do you love me? And then go feed my flock, right? Because your ministry always, always needs to flow out of your love for the Lord and love for the people. And that is what he's telling the efficient church. And how do you restore that first love? He presents three things. He said, remember, right? Take time, not today, you know, but any day the Lord speaks to you. Take time, reflect and remember your relationship with Jesus Christ, that relational dimension. And, uh, where it has gone away from God. And then secondly, he says, repent, repent, right? Renounce whatever is displeasing and repent from whatever you do and towards God. And the third thing he says that redo, do again what you did first, right? Uh, meaning that, you know, once again, get back to that, you know, life of love that flows out in right thinking and in right living. And finally, what does God do? He says, if you overcome, that's how in every church he says, he who overcomes, what does he do? He says, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life, right? Immediately you remember what happened, you know, Adam and Eve who were stopped from going to and eat the tree of life in Garden of Eden. But here he says that right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now the word paradise comes from a Persian word. Uh, it is about a garden, a pleasure, a beautiful garden where the Persian emperor or king will host his, uh, his uh, guests, you know, to, to have, uh, you know, a time of relational time. And he says that, you know, if you bring all these strands of uh, Christianity together and you have that orthochristianity relating to God and with others with love, what happens? Again, he emphasized that relation with God, right? We would spend all our time with God you know, in the paradise or in eternity. Of course, there are several interpretations of paradise. I would not want to go in there. But I want to leave with you this thought, saying that where is our love for God this morning, this evening? Where is our love for God? In the book of Hosea, if you have time, please go back and read. That's an epistle of love in the Old Testament. And God asked one of his own, his prophet, to go and marry a prostitute and to show love to her just the same way God shows love to the nation of Israel that has prostituted itself uh, with several other gods. And as you read through the particular second chapter, he talks about how he must show the love to this uh, woman, the same love God has for his people. And later on, as you go down you know, in that same book, you read how he describes the love of his people. He says, your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. You would have seen the dew, right? In a grass, in the morning, it glistens like a diamond. But when the scorching sun comes up, that 
dew disappears. So I want to ask you tonight, as the servant of God, as I bring this word to you, this is the word that the Spirit of God wants to ask with you, is that how is your love for the Lord and love for others? Is it like a morning mist? Is it like a, is it like a dew that disappears easily? But is it still vibrant? So this evening, you and I can bring our lives to the Lord and say, Jesus, hear our lives, Lord. Restore us, Lord, to from where we have fallen. Jesus, we want to have this auto-Christianity and we want to make an impact in the world. No matter how many Domitians come up, remember our Lord is on the throne and he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. With this picture, you and I can come and surrender ourselves before the throne of Jesus tonight. So I want to briefly pause for a moment and take some time to pray with you as we look at this passage and to reflect on what the Lord has been speaking to us tonight. Shall we briefly pray? As we close our eyes and as we remain in the presence of the living God, um, tonight, the Spirit of God is asking this pointed question. Do you love me? The pointed question Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Or where is your first love? Where is your first love? And tonight we can bring our lives and say, Lord, here am I. I'm offering myself to you, Lord. I'm offering myself, Lord, tonight to you. I'm offering, Lord, right thinking, right living, and right loving. Lord, to this end, we commit our lives. Would that be our prayer? Father, tonight we come before you and we offer our lives to you, Lord. Not only to have the right thinking and right living, Lord, but to have the right loving out of which all our thinking and our, and our, and our laboring flows out, Lord. So tonight, Father, I bring my life to you, Lord. We bring our lives to you, Lord, to the one who is seated on the throne, Lord, Reminding us, Lord, it's not the Domitians of the world who are in control, but it is you who are seated on the throne, the ruler of the kings of the earth. And Lord, to this king, we offer ourselves tonight in the name of your son and your savior and our savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.